All right, so we got 231. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for everyone that's joining us. Um, we're going to go through um, some of the brand story, uh, a little bit about our background, and we'll go through some of the deals, a little bit about the technology and some of the features that uh, we're going to be uh, rolling out in the near future. So uh, the story really does start here. So uh, for us, you know, we've been in and out of real estate for a while. And uh, one thing that became clear to all of us is uh, that if you weren't born and invested in the Gilded World of Real Estate, good luck crashing the party. Um, we have some experiences that we'll touch on later in this presentation. But uh, one thing that we've observed is that it's just got a super high barrier of entry. Um, and a lot of people out there that if they're not in the industry, they're not in finance, they're not in some connecting part of the commercial real estate development or investment game, it's incredibly hard. You either have to have a ton of money or you have to know someone or you have to have some sophisticated network in order to get into the upside of, of any one deal. Uh, but at the same time, as uh, all of us were individually looking at the next opportunity that we wanted to jump into from a business standpoint, we realized that uh, crowdfunding real estate was starting to pick up. Um, you have other companies out there that were really making a lot of headway and doing a lot of great things, but we saw a lot of opportunity that that opportunities that were missed. Um, and one of those opportunities was really tapping into the potential of the crowd um, and, and really getting regular people in the game and getting them a seat at the table and getting them represented. A lot of these other firms we've noticed um, are going after uh, financial savvy people, uh, existing real estate investors, but no one's really going after and talking to and inviting uh, the everyday person into uh, the discussion. So for us, the promise of real estate, it's locked behind doors. And a lot of those doors, most people don't even know exist. So we wanted to build a platform that really put an end to that. Uh, and we believe that anyone can benefit from institutional grade real estate. And we believe everyone should have access to ownership. So we're kicking down doors and we are making sure that everyone has access to that opportunity. So ultimately, investing in real estate, it's not the new thing, but it's how we're doing it. So here's a little look at our platform, or at least how to get into the app. So first of all, it's the multi-fund investment platform. Uh, it's an app that's already available. Um, it's a minimally viable product that works. We have hundreds of investors that have already signed on, created an account, and invested money into our first fund. It's a re-ownership structure. Um, Steve, our general counsel, uh, and head of compliance, he'll go deeper into what that structure looks like, but it's essentially a pretty standard real estate investment trust. And what we're really going for is the acquisition of cash flowing assets to build a cohesive cash flowing portfolio. So you have an entire portfolio of uh, properties that are all performing. And uh, I'll let Steve go into the SEC and the FINRA, but we are SEC qualified and FINRA compliant. And we launched the app in January, 2023. So within the past two to three months, we've had a lot of great traction um, and we've raised a good amount of capital that we're actually very close to putting into the market. And later on, Mark, our CEO, Mark Drachman, will go into some of the deals we've been looking at. So I'll pass off to Steve right now, who's going to go into deeper uh, uh, detail about what the offering looks like, what it's called, and the structure. Okay. So our inaugural fund is called Fund Rebel Dean. Um, that's how we are identifying it and putting it out there to the market. And essentially, the way this offering is going to work is as follows. Um, through the SEC, there is something that is called Regulation A. Uh, what Reg A is, is a 
exemption for small businesses and startups to offer and sell securities. Generally, in order to sell securities to the public, you need what is known as a IPO or initial public offering. Um, that is extremely expensive and would put many companies, um, you know, just out of business or as far as, you know, being able to solicit and sell securities to the public. So they came up with this exemption, uh, exemption again, called um, Regulation A. Now, what that allows us to do <clears throat> is through the Regulation A model, also known as Reg A, is that there are two different types of tiers. There's tier one and tier two. We are utilizing the tier two method, which allows us to raise up to $75 million from investors. Um, now, the way it works with how you can raise that money is there is something which is known as an offering circular or a draft 1A. That's something which you got to go ahead and register with the SEC that's on their website. And essentially, whatever it says in there is what you must be compliant with. You cannot vary from that in anything uh, which would be uh, known as a material um, change from that could you know uh, get someone into hot water. So if anyone's ever interested in who we are and really digging deep into that and seeing what we're about, um, you know, obviously we're going to share that uh, more over here, but that's where all the information is located. Now, the way, again, this uh, is structured, we have a lot of freedom, how we want to structure it internally. So we structured it that there's $10 per share with a minimum investment of $1,000. You can purchase shares uh, beginning at $10. The shares also, we set them up that they're freely tradable which I'll go into momentarily, but essentially another big, <clears throat> um, something which is uh, very beneficial of this regulation A model is that it allows us to sell securities to all kinds of investors. And that means even people who are unaccredited, that typically means investors with under a million dollars net worth. So, you know, typically if you want to invest, um, you may be uh, limited to how you can invest, especially in real estate, that's typically, like Dan was saying, something which is reserved for the ultra wealthy. But over here, using this model, we brought it to the everyday person. So again, uh, as previously mentioned, you could get started with as little as $1,000. And also, there's what we call, the way we structured it over here, is your shares represent direct equity. We like that term because what it means is as follows. Those shares A are freely tradable. So that means you own it, it's yours. If you purchase them at a later point in time, you want to go ahead and sell them, um, you can go and do that because it's yours. That ownership is something which no one could take from you. Um, as well, what that allows for is, for example, there's something called securities-backed loans. Typically, if uh, you know one of the ways the rich get richer is they don't necessarily sell their investments. They go to a bank or they go and to a lender and they take out some sort of loan, which they have securitized by their assets. Now, these shares represent direct equity. So that means you can go and attempt to get some sort of loan if necessary and use your shares as collateral. Or if you want to, you know, hold on to these shares themselves um, until, you know, for the entire lifetime of the fund, you can do that. You can also go ahead and access liquidity if you want. We are building out a secondary trading platform, which again, I'm going to let some of the others on here uh, discuss more in depth, which will allow you to sell those to other potential investors. And you can then go ahead and you know get out of that investment if that's something that you uh, so choose. Um, Thanks, Steve. Hmm? Thank you. Okay. Um, another point. Yes. So this is really important also over here. And this is going to be the final thing that I want to really touch on is that there are no upfront fees. Now, I understand that people may be, uh, you know, listening to this and think, uh, shouldn't that be something that is uh, understood, you know, when you're investing? And the answer is um, not really. You know, in general, when you invest, especially with some of the other platforms out there, um, they claim to potentially be bringing real estate to the masses. But what they're doing is they're not doing it in the same way that, you know, if you have some wealthy individuals who are investing in real estate through a general partner and a limited partner structure, they're not doing it in the same way. What they're doing is they're bringing minimal, you know, uh, they're bringing investments, which will give you some sort of return, but then they charge all these additional fees, which if you are ultra wealthy or you are able to put in $100,000 at a shot into an investment, it, that's not exactly how it would be structured. So what we structured our funds is 
uh, through what's called the promote structure. That means in order for our company to be successful, we are directly tied to your interest. So the more successful the investment is and the investors, which are you and the shareholders, the more successful the company can be. Now I'm going to let Mark and uh, Mark Drachman, our CEO, as well as Hussein, Sonara, and others um, expound on this more, but that's basically the model. When we say we're bringing real estate investing to everyone, we mean it in the truest sense, and not that we're going to bring it to you, but you know, with uh, in some other sort of way. We're going to do it the same way that if you were able to do this you know, through $100,000 investments, you can now do it with a minimum of $1,000. And I'm going to pass it off now to uh, Mark Drachman, our CEO. Hi, I'm Mark Drachman. I'm the CEO over here at FunRebel. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the income model. What we mean by the income model is how is it that you actually make money? How should you, you know, expect to be able to participate and what you should expect from these shares and how they're going to operate? So there are basically three different ways that you're going to be able to you know, access your shares and make money off of them. The first one, as Steve was explaining before, is that the shares are freely tradable. So that means... Once the fund closes 12 months after it opens, which is going to be at the end of 2023, that fund is closed forever. What this means is however much equity that fund raised, albeit if it has a full raise up to $75 million or whatever that is, that money is then going to be allocated over different types of commercial properties. And those properties are going to pay off dividends based on the cash flow that those properties represent. Okay, so as time goes on, if those cash flow, if the cash flow continues to grow, be it all rental increases or whatever it is that happens within the confines of the funds, the value of your securities should be able to grow as well. So that means, let's say two or three years into your investment, if somebody else comes in and they want to invest in Fund Rebel to whatever fund that's being invested in at that time, if maybe they like the assets from Fund 1 that you originally invested or Fund 2, they'll have the ability to go and purchase those shares from the original shareholder owners. Fund Rebel is not going to be able to sell those shares anymore because the fund is closed and the fund will be 100% owned by the shareholders. And this will allow for a liquidity option that is fairly unprecedented in the commercial real estate world. And it's a problem that people generally speak about a lot in real estate, that liquidity is a big problem with it. So here, because as Steve was explaining before, you have that real equity ownership, these shares are be able to be sold or borrowed against or whatever it is however it is that you want to deal with them. There's also going to be quarterly dividends. REITs are obligated to basically disperse up to 90% of their, uh, of their earnings. So every quarter, 90% of the available earnings from whatever you know, properties that it owns are then going to be distributed to all the shareholders. So you're going to have quarterly dividends, which is going to represent income. And that's actually going to dictate the value of your securities at any given time. Eventually, Whenever it is that we internally feel that is a good time to wind down the funds, maybe there's a very high point in the market, there was some opportunistic things that happened that created a lot of value within the funds, let's say the fund winds down and everything is sold, all the profits that are available after that sale are then going to be distributed to the shareholders, power pursuit to their ownership interests and their securities that they own. Um, Another important thing about these shares, which are also not really done in Reg A and is often done in general regular syndications dealing with the general partnership and limited partnership structure, is people want a, pre a PREF or a preferred return. So these shares are actually a security with a preference share. What does that mean? That means that when income comes in, actually, let me just back up and explain. Basically, the way that Fund Rebel makes money, as Steve was explaining before, is through the promote structure. This means the more money that we make for these shares and the more money cash these properties give off, the more money that FunRebel makes and the more money our investors make. So we take 30% of the upside, meaning all of the profits, 30% of that is FunRebel's, I guess, management income. But prior to that 30% being taken, there's a preference share that's paid to the shareholders. So for example, there are two different types of shares that are being offered by Fund Rebel. There's class A shares and class B shares. Class B shares are anyone that comes in with a minimum $1,000 investment and you have a 6% preferred return tied. So that means that the investor and the shareholder has to get their 6% return before Fund Rebel takes a penny off of their 30% promote, 
which will then kick in after they get their 6% preferred return. Going forward, anything on top of that, which we're hoping is going to be much more obviously, um, again, 70% of all that available income will continue to go to the shareholders, but 6% considered a bottom line for class B shareholders. Class A shareholders, if they put up a million dollars as a minimum investment, is going to have the same structure and the same ownership interest, but they're going to have an 8% preferred return that's going to be tied to their securities. Thank you, Mark. Got it. So now, how do we get from point A to point B? Um, the easiest way is to download our app on the either Apple uh, Store or the Google Play Store. Um, once you've completed your download, it's a very simple, put your email in and your password in, and from there you press create an account, and you'll be brought to a page where now it will take and get all your other information. The point of all of these, um, in, in, in all of this, the point here is to make it simple and easy to get through. The process usually on any deal is a very cumbersome process. Here we've set it up where then within under 10 minutes, you should be completed and you should get an email from um, DocuSign to sign your documents and you've subscribed. Next slide. One of the things, one of the things on all of this is our flexible funding. You can put it in by a credit card. You can put it in by a wire. One of the things we've done as well is allow us to move over a 401k or an IRA into the um, into the the account. The other things that we have that we're, we're in the process of doing, it's not up yet and it's not live yet, is a custodial account. Someone makes a uh, couple of dollars, their kid, whether it's shoveling snow or doing odds and ends, and they want to invest. You'll be able to invest for your child in the near future. Furthermore, the other thing we are in the process of doing is doing monthly installments. That once you hit your minimum of $1,000 into the fund, you will be able to put in sums of money on a monthly basis. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, so Alan Custom is our uh, chief operating officer, and he's really the glue that uh, holds a lot of this together and and uh, really is, uh, is vital to the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, but now we're going to go to Hussein Sanara, who is our chief strategy officer. He has really been pivotal and, and responsible for a lot of the long-term vision of where we're going to go and how we're going to go out and uh, really bring everyone to the table and, and take this great ride along the way of building a, a wonderful portfolio. So go ahead, Hussein, thank you. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> uh, my name is Hussein, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about who can be a fun rebel and what is a fun rebel and how did we arrive at the, at the name and what the philosophy behind that is. Um, the economy that has evolved that all of us participate in and live in is one that allows for <clears throat> a lot of people to um, participate in great high barrier to entry industries, but uh, in the grand scheme of things, the majority of people do not get the opportunity to participate in high barrier to entry industries and opportunities. And you have an entire segment of society that constitutes the majority of society um, who have to offset their income and their earnings by doing a lot of different things. People that are not um, necessarily satisfied with just a nine to five and are willing to go and do whatever it takes to increase the value and sometimes the production value of their life and the way that they live their lives and plan for their futures and their families. And our overall vision for the company is one that allows for the inclusion of an increasing amount of that segment of society and create a bridge to connect as many people as we can from uh, those areas and echelons of society into the higher echelons of society that govern and operate these industries. Real estate uh, fundamentally is where all of our backgrounds are from and where we've spent the majority of our professional careers. And we have noticed that unless you are in, you are out. And uh, to create a platform that allows for people who may have the interest but have no means of access 
or no uh, ability to even see a way of access unless they choose to commit their entire life to this, that presents a tremendous opportunity. Um, so for the people out there who are interested in improvement, uh, are interested in the capitalism game, uh, and interested in real estate, this is who this platform is for. Um, so we get into a little bit about you know various profiles uh, of people, but it really is for anybody and everybody. Somebody that has a professional career already who is doing well, but wants to gain some exposure and doesn't see the angle. Uh, people who work in parallel or ancillary industries and have seen it sort of through the looking glass, but never been able to gain a seat at that table. Uh, people that do not have the amount of capital required to gain this kind of exposure. It is for everybody. And that is the thing that really creates the greatest excitement for us because there is so much power in the crowd that in today's world is only beginning to just get tapped into. We look at the overall crowdfunding industry uh, and how it has brought so many different opportunities to fruition, uh, not just in real estate, but in, in many different industries. And we see that we are just at the absolute advent of it for real estate, that eventually shareholdings and the splintering of large scale commercial real estate into individual shareholders is something that this company aims to be a, a very big and long term part of. Um, the story of how we got here. Uh, is the story of how we had all worked within the industry and experienced um, the highs and the lows, and specifically how some of the founders group here got together uh, was amidst those sort of trenches that uh, bring out sort of the best and the worst of everybody that is participating in things that have a lot of money at stake and, uh, and, and found each other that way. And we can get into a little bit of that um, a little bit later. Um, but all of us started at the beginning. We each individually had a desire to participate in this business, saw what was possible, and had a burning desire inside of us to be involved. And that involvement started for all of us a little bit differently, but generally speaking the same. You do whatever you can to get a foot in the door, and then you just keep going. And you find success, you find resistance, you find uh, unsuccess, so to speak. And you just keep going because you know that there is the potential on the horizon. We met with serious players in the business, people that are the boldest face names, who when you're young and you're starting are not interested in hearing what you have to say. And in some cases, maybe even look at you as though future competition and need to be eliminated from future competition. Um, and those are all very formative, crystallizing experiences that lend themselves to create the notion that, well, if they did it, we can do it. And then that set us all off on our various careers. Um, these careers have spanned a tremendous amount of significant core real estate uh, in the highest barrier to entry marketplaces, New York City, Manhattan. Um, Mark, Alan, myself all have experience in the development of real estate. And we've all had our hand in the development of millions of square feet of real estate and definitely in excess of 10 figures worth of value that has been created and accredited and attributed to private portfolios in our various professional histories, uh, as well as um, participating in things that are looked upon as sort of impossible, very difficult, very challenging, and coming out the other side successfully. And once you have that and realize that you can accomplish that, you realize that you can repeat that formula. And that's a formula that we very much want to repeat with the generation of members and participants and investors to join our company. And we wanna take the same uh, lessons and same knowledge that we have and go and create new portfolios uh, for all of our membership and anybody who wants to participate. Um, the notion of investing alongside whales is uh, probably one of the core tenets of our, our proposition here. Um, people who have the capital and invest will see the same value in the deals and the promote structure that Mark outlined earlier that uh, someone who can only invest $1,000 may see. And from a pro rata and, and parapasu perspective, everybody will benefit the same. That's a structure that does not exist really out there in the world, whether it's in the crowdfunded real estate world or the private real estate investment marketplace. And we aim to be uh, a beacon for that. And we aim to have all of our participants and investors look to us, invest with us, and possibly even 
learn from things that we are doing. And we also aim to learn from the participants who join our cause, because we believe that within the crowd, other than just the dollars, there's a tremendous amount of value to be gleaned for more and more participants with us. We, we don't view it as a, a black bag. We think that it is more of an open source kind of proposition. And we fully expect that the highest level of value is gonna come from having more and more people join us at a low level, a mid level, a high level. To us, it doesn't matter. There's value in all of it. Thanks, Hussein. Um, so, you know, specifically, we have to execute. Uh, for us, a great idea is a great idea, um, but 98% of anything that's worth being a part of is all about execution. So, you know, how are we going to deliver? For us, it's a two part delivery process. Uh, we have a team, a founder team that comes from technology and design. And then we have another half of the founder team that uh, you just heard from that comes from uh, really high level commercial real estate. So our goal is to put those two things together and really supercharge how opportunities are delivered and accessed by uh, the broad stroke of people out there. And we wanna make sure that we do it in the easiest and fastest and most simple way so that people who are not anywhere near the real estate industry and to their appetite, desire, get a full understanding of what makes it work and what specifically makes it work for them. So as we are, continue to build on our minimally viable product that is our platform that is out there and um, available for download right now, we're going to continue to build custom nodes and pieces and custom proprietary uh, components that will streamline that. Later on, we'll get to the point where you'll be able to see real-time footage or or very recent photography of value add work that we're doing on some of the assets so that you can really have that sense of ownership over this asset. So if you're invested in our fund that holds that asset, you can actually look at your phone as if you're looking at your own real estate portfolio remotely. Um, furthermore, we'll get into some experiential uh, opportunities for some of our investors as well, too, where they'll get to come out to these properties. They'll get to walk the site with the founder group, with the leadership group, and really, really learn firsthand what it takes on the day-to-day -day boots on the ground to work this type of asset or, or manage this type of uh, portfolio. Um, which is why we have uh, the amazing Al Spawn on our team. He is a seasoned veteran of technology. He's been a part of some of the most pivotal uh, software applications uh, for decades. And uh, I'll let him talk a little bit about the footprint that we have here. This is not meant for everyone to absorb. It's just a general uh, 30,000 foot view of the system we put in place and how we're gonna be building on top of it. Go ahead, Al, thank you. Well, thanks, Dan. Uh, you know, so now that I sound like really old, it, it has been decades, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but listen, you know, my name's Al Spawn, CTO for Fun Rebel. Um, we spent about 18 months putting together a platform and system so that um, these guys can can do their jobs uh, and get us deals that will work inside of the system and we can get investors into it. Um, it's a very secure system. It's a system that's ever evolving for us. Um, we have it everything from the front ends of your application to be able to sign up within minutes and invest um, down to reporting systems that give uh, the guys you know the information that they need to get through. Um, we are currently, working on multiple different builds that um, will give more access to investors and to our teams. And, uh, you know, we should hope to uh, release more pieces within the coming months. I'm quick. <laughs> but for us, it's all about producing those types of insights and analytics because eventually we'll start to amass a, a lot of data and that data will be high value. Um, and first and foremost, we're going to make sure that our user experience is streamlined and that that data, the value of that data, first and foremost, is passed on to our investors um, and not you know, licensed or sold out. Um, but the whole idea is we're heading towards a fully a uh, custom proprietary vertically integrated ecosystem that uh, people cannot get anywhere else. So we'll go back to Mark now so we can walk through some of the deals that we've looked at um, leading up to, you know, sort of the activity over the past several months 
of getting to those deals. Go ahead, Mark. Yep. So even before I even talk about the deal specifically, I just want everyone to understand that when we came into the market and we looked right now, what is out there and what are people offering non-accredited investors as investments? Just to give you an idea, pr prior to coming into Fund Rebel, we syndicate commercial real estate, at least Alan and myself and Hussein were involved in the putting together of different investment vehicles in order for people to participate in different types of real estate investments. The way that people do that is normally with a preferred return and a promote for the general partners for doing a great job. And the types of properties that wealthy individuals, institutional investors, or family offices want to participate in are normally properties that have a very aggressive exit while mitigating risk as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's a thin line to be able to deal with both of those simultaneously, but that's how they choose their properties. The properties that have been available you know, to regular investors online through these different types of platforms, however many they may be, are not these types of properties. These are the types of properties that are just saying, we are commercial real estate. If you want to participate, come here. But they're using the idea of commercial real estate in order to be able to entice investors. And the structure that they're using is not a structure that regular investors would be able to participate in. So the structure that we have here is the exact same structure that we have participated in, in the past. And I want to talk about the types of properties that we're looking at the, and how we actually look at these properties, how we differentiate between a property that we actually want to move forward on or a property that we do not want to move forward on. And, you know, just going into properties in general, there's obviously a lot of different asset classes. We don't, you know, eliminate any one. There's obviously certain asset classes, which I'll speak about that we lean towards more than others. But, you know, for example, you have you have office buildings, you have industrial properties and warehouses, you have retail, you have hospitality, you have multifamily. There's a lot of different subsets of these asset classes. But in general, we like to look for properties that, again, as mitigating risk, like for example, with office, I'm not going to go look at any types of suburban office spaces. Nowadays, I'm probably not going to look at much office space at all, unless you know there's some type of distress asset that we could be able to take advantage of in an extremely core area. Um, but I would say our primary focus is going to be multifamily. And even within multifamily, there are many different sectors. <laughs> you know, when people just say oh, an apartment building, you know, th there's ways to look at an apartment building. There's a stabilized asset that's already up and running and doesn't really need a lot of work. And it's rented already at the, you know, highest occupancy or the highest price per square foot for rent that it could possibly get. And it's basically just management and taking on the income. Then there's value add properties, which are properties that are not being run properly. They're distressed. They're mismanaged. They could have, you know, incurred, you know, fires or water damage or whatever it is that happens that you can go in there and do a lot of actual work rebrand the property, put it on the market, let the property make more money, increasing the actual value of the property, which obviously takes a lot more work and know-how and experience in order to be able to execute such a property. But within those properties, you also have to look at your market. So there's core markets, there are secondary markets, and there are tertiary markets, right? So unfortunately, a couple of years ago, when real estate was extremely, extremely hot and interest rates were very, very low, and everybody was out there trying to buy deals, and it wasn't really accessible, certain core markets for people to get into, people started dropping down to secondary markets and tertiary markets. The problem with these tertiary markets that a lot of people purchased a while ago is that these markets tend to have, you know, a, you know, a lot of basic unemployment, their unemployment rate happens to be very high. They have, they don't have a lot of large employment factors in the area. The arrears tend to be a lot in properties. The vacancy tends to be a lot more than would be typical for that type of asset. And there's a lot of other things <clears throat> happen with these tertiary markets, especially after, for example, during COVID, where you had all the, these small to mid-sized businesses got wiped out. People really had to focus on areas with, you know, larger corporations that give out, you know, jobs in order to be able for people to be able to pay their rent. So we really don't look at any tertiary, tertiary or even secondary markets at this point. We're really looking at mostly core markets or properties surrounding core markets. But even within those core markets, there are certain variables that we always look at. So ju just to give off a few, if I'm looking at an apartment building, I'm going to look at, let's say, three factors right up front. I would look at my price per unit, my price per square foot, 
in my comparables for rent. What does that mean? That means every time I buy a property, there are other properties that have been sold in that area, right? So I'm going to go look at it. I'm going to say my price per unit is that on average with what other properties are selling for in the area, is that less or is that more? My price per square foot, if a property is, you know, 100,000 square feet and that property is selling for, let's say, you know, $100 a square foot. Are other properties selling for $100 a square foot? It's obviously going to sell for much more than that or less and so on. And then you're going to have your comparables for rent, right? If this property is saying that they're getting $3 a foot on a monthly basis for rent and other properties next door are getting $2 and $2 and 20 cents, there's not really going to be a lot of growth for me because it seems like it's at the top of the market or it might even be too expensive. So I have to hit all three of those factors in order to be able to even look at a property properly. And if there's, you know, those factors are lower than average, that obviously tells me that there's an indication that there's some value to be made within those properties. Then we take all of that information and we put it together with today's debt market. And then once looking at our projections or what our actual income is on that and what today's debt markets are, we have to look at what our DSCR is. Our DSCR is our debt service coverage ratio. In general, when a bank underwrites a property, they look at DSCR, let's say, for example, most conventional banks are going to look somewhere around 1.2, which means that the actual net income after expenses has to exceed the debt service by 1.2 times annually. Some, you know, very aggressive lenders might even go to 1.17, 1.19. Internally, we, we look for 1.3, which gives us a large margin for error. And it's harder to find these deals, but within today's market and with, you know, being opportunistic and really going out there and hunting, we've, we've definitely found a few of them. So uh, let's go into just some of the properties that we've looked at. We've actually looked at hundreds of properties, but here I think we're going to put take a look at three different properties that we actually went into due diligence on. Two of them we backed away from, and I'll explain those as well. So here's one property, for example. This property is located in Harwell, Georgia. Harwell, Georgia. Harwell is a suburb just outside of Atlanta. This property was an opportunistic property. So what do I mean by that? This property was purchased by a new uh, coming syndication group a couple years ago. And when they looked at the property, they took bridge financing, expecting to spend a certain amount of CapEx on the property to be able to fix everything up, rent it for a lot of money and do a great job. Unfortunately, their underwriting told them that they needed a million dollars for capital expenditures in the property where they probably really needed north of $4 million. And then once they closed on their bridge loan, they started getting into the property. They realized they didn't have enough money to renovate the property and bring it to market properly. This property ends up going upside down for them. And we have an opportunity to go out there and take the property at a lower purchase price, put in the right amount of capital expenditures, and see if we can position the property properly for an exit. It happens to be specifically for this property. We didn't love the area specifically that it was in. The absorption wasn't exactly where we wanted it to be. Absorption, meaning at any given time, there's only a certain amount of people looking for apartments to rent in a certain area. So just because you build a beautiful apartment building with 500 units doesn't mean there's 500 people right now in today's market willing to go rent those property. So we basically had our price for the actual property. We needed to pay a little bit less. Unfortunately, the, the seller wasn't able to do that because they were really in a difficult situation and they made some wrong decisions. Our absorption was a problem. And the fact that it wasn't exactly in a core location, it was more of a secondary market that we didn't feel comfortable with, we ended up walking away from it. Um, our next property that we were looking at, this property we liked a lot. It was in uh, an area called Pompano Beach, Florida. It was a beautiful neighborhood. It was a waterfront property consisting of two buildings with 19 units. It had a swimming pool. It had two boat docks. Um, the problem with this specific property was that price per unit was okay for the area. Price per square foot was okay for the area, but they were all studios and one bedrooms. And once we ran the numbers, we realized that a traditional rental model for this property wouldn't basically equate to a positive outcome because the price per unit over the past two years was so inflated by the market that the rental market wasn't able to catch up in time and give us the income that we needed to pay our investors their preferred return and make enough money on it. So there were a lot of different 
models that we looked at into this property. We looked at maybe taking one of the properties and making it short-term rentals and leaving the other one as basically, you know, regular multifamily long-term lease, you know, a long-term lease uh, apartments. And we still didn't like exactly where we were. And the problem is also, once you start transitioning the use of a property, your property is underwritten differently by banks because you have a different asset class. You're actually going towards short-term rentals and lodging, and you're going to get hospitality type funding instead of multifamily, which tends to be a little bit more expensive. And your LTVs tend to be a little lower, which result in a lower cash on cash return than normally anticipated. That combined with the fact that internally, um, we don't really want to do short-term rentals just yet because short-term rentals tend to be a lot harder to project. The market can have a lot of swings with occupancy, and we think it's just very important that we have solid income every quarter to be able to distribute to our to our different investors, and short-term rentals really didn't speak to that. So we ended up walking away from this deal as well. Then we're coming to a property that we absolutely fell in love with. This property was an off-market deal where we had an opportunity to be able to take advantage of. So what happened here was there was a very large developer in South Florida who had a variety of different develops whose primary objective was, I believe, condominium development over the past 20 years. And this was the first rental building that this company was building. They currently have another project that was probably closer to a half a billion dollars that they were building. And it was a project that was going through three phases or several phases in the project. They finished phase one a couple of years ago. And unfortunately, when you do different phases, a lot of times that you go through different forms of financing throughout your phases. And obviously the debt market changed a lot from where he started his first phase to his second phase. Long story short, they were requiring equity for other parts of their portfolio. And we had an opportunity to go in there and make a deal to purchase a brand new constructed rental building at a price of construction that he was basically, you know, contracted in at from two years ago construction, which is much less than it would cost right now. And we're getting to purchase a property in an extremely core area. The property is located in downtown Hollywood. It has 206 rental units. It has over 7,000 square feet of retail. It is surrounded by other large scale developer buildings which are completely sold out. So our comparables per square foot, we don't have to project what it is that we believe we're gonna get. We can look across the street and see what it is that we're getting. So this property, just to give people an idea, we are buying this property. We're building to, building it to a projected 7.2% capitalization rate. So a capitalization rate or a cap rate, which is also referred to in the industry often, represents if you own a property, how much income it should get, be given off. So for example, if you own a property, for a million dollars and you buy it all cash at a 7.2 cap, you should expect a $72,000 a year income to be put into your pocket. When you combine that with a leverage that is lower than your 7.2, your cash on cash return goes up. So for example, if I'm at a 7.2 cap and I'm taking a loan at a 75% loan to value at a 6.2% interest loan or a 6% interest only loan, in it, you go from basically a 7.2% return to closer to a 10% cash on cash return. So in order to be able to buy a property in a core area north of a seven cap in today's market, th this has been completely unprecedented for the past couple of years. So we're very excited and we feel very lucky to be able to offer this to the investors for, for their first asset. Thanks, Mark. Got it. So a little bit more about our team um, and some of the uh, beliefs that we are putting out into everything that we do with this company. Um, you know, we're not underdogs. We're big game hunters, as uh, you see with that property that Mark just reviewed. Uh, we, we're incredibly excited about it, and we're looking forward to the future uh, with properties like that um, in, our, in our targets. So. You know, everything we do, we apply a certain sense of focus and obsessive passion um, and, a, and a rigor to it to make sure that the bottom line is that our fiduciary responsibility to our investors is maintained to the highest standards. For example, Mark, he's got over 20 years in the business. He's done half a billion dollars in commercial and residential transactional volume. Same with Alan. 20-year track record. Uh, he has some amazing projects that he's worked on in the past 
Uh, Alan, do you want to touch on any of those projects that we list at the bottom? So just to name a few, we uh, I worked on with the building code and zoning department for Madison Square Garden when they did the renovation. Um, worked on some of the large projects in Midtown Manhattan, such as the International Gem Tower and uh, a condo building down in, in uh, downtown Manhattan, um, 56 Leonard, amongst many other projects that I've done. Great, thank you. And uh, to uh, Hussein, our chief strategy officer, I have the privilege of, of knowing him for decades. Uh, we've, we've been close friends for a very long time. And uh, when we first met was towards the beginning of the real estate career. And I've got to watch some of the amazing projects that he's gotten in and out of. Um, Hussein, do you wanna to touch on any of, of the highlights of your experience in the, in the past? Uh, so most of my experience is uh, encompassed mainly in the New York City uh, commercial real estate landscape, which is sort of a, a paradigm for all real estate nationwide. Um, if you can do it in New York, you can kind of do it anywhere. Everybody in every other jurisdiction has their own specific rules that they want you to follow. But New York has very arduous barriers to be able to conduct and exercise construction and development. Um, I ran a portfolio of commercial office buildings that was about four and a half million square feet in Manhattan, including the MTA headquarters, uh, executed the construction and development of about a million and a half square feet, mainly for uh, commercial uh, office tenants, a lot of them the Fortune 500, uh, and have uh, executed a number of ground up condominium developments, some with some uh, massive award winning architects who don't make it easy, but do create and design beautiful product. And uh, all of the experience in terms of dealing with uh, everybody in the entire ecosystem, from partners and financiers and lenders and authorities having jurisdiction to architects, engineers, and construction personnel, um, the management of the different players and actors, uh, and to get the best out of them has really been what my core focus has been. Uh, and along the way, uh, learning as much as I could about how to execute all and any of it. Um, for all of us, this is certainly a passion. Uh, for me, it's been a passion for my entire career. And I think that I speak for all of us when I say that we all look forward to taking that passion and infusing it into this company and delivering as we have on any other portfolio that we've ever touched uh, for all of our shareholders and, and investors here. Thank you. As mentioned before, uh, our chief technology officer, Alice Vaughn, he's got a long track record and he's done some pretty amazing things uh, in the technology space. Al, do you wanna to touch on any of those highlights? You're muted. Sure, I've been doing this for about 25 years now. Um, you know, everything from pre-GPS geo-tracking to airline reservation system on to you know, tech for um, real estate companies and staffing and the staffing industry, um, you know, have built some really um, interesting pieces of tech over that time that, uh, you know, I just continue to get involved with uh, really good people building really good stuff. Thank you. Um, I'm the chief marketing officer of Fun Rebel. I have over 15 years of design marketing strategy experience. I've worked for Fortune 500 companies, both um, on the client side and the agency side. I've led several creative teams uh, with different agencies. And uh, I've worked in verticals and industries spanning from finance, real estate, sports, retail, agriculture, nonprofits, and technology, as well as uh, CPG. And uh, I think, I really think this is the best project uh, I've ever had the opportunity to work on. And uh, I think that the, the rest of the leadership team forms just the perfect roster of, of people to go out and, and, and capitalize on the vision that, that we've laid out here. And we have our general counsel, Steve. Um, go ahead, Steve. Um, I've worked at a number of different firms. I focused uh, product liability litigation. They had a whole securities litigation um, over there as well. Complex real estate transactions, business restructuring, compliance. Um, so just being here is fantastic. And this is a dream. And uh, with the team, uh, like everyone else on here, this is, uh, I think we're well suited to move forward and really do uh, best by our investors.
So how to stay connected. Um, we've spent the past six to eight months uh, rolling out this brand and starting to populate content uh, into our social channels. Our main channels are Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Discord. Uh, if you guys follow us already, thank you. Uh, if not, please you know drop us a a follow or, or a couple likes here and there when you see us put out content. A lot of content thus far has been really trying to get people to understand the flavor and the look and feel of the brand and some of the tone and voice that we're going out there in. Um, but as we start to really venture into the next chapter in the evolution of this business, uh, there's going to be a lot more information uh, and it's going to be of a higher magnitude uh, around the deals that we're doing and the uh, really the open window into what it looks like to you know negotiate contracts and sign deals and due diligence and all the things that you you hear about uh, when these deals are being put together, but you just don't really know what they look like uh, for, per se. Uh, we're going to be capturing content across the board and we'll be putting it out on these channels so that you know really the big mainstay of our business is we want to make sure that everything is transparent. We're pretty much an open book. Uh, anyone can reach out to us anytime, and we're always happy to engage at any level. Uh, the other way to stay in contact, if if you're not really avid social media, is just throw your email in our website. Uh, this will be sure to uh, keep you in the loop whenever we send out email updates. Um, we haven't really spammed out much, if any at all. It's really meant to be a high uh, quality and low quantity means of contact to make sure that when you see a Fundrebel email come in, it's because we have something major to say, or we have some real interesting content that we think that you'd be interested in. So if you're not already a subscriber, go ahead and sign in. Uh, you also automatically are opted into this list whenever you create a profile on the app. Uh, so that's also another good way to stay in the loop. And one of the more exciting things that we started uh, early on with is, is putting out podcasts. Um, we think that it's just another way for people to get comfortable and get to know some of the topics and some of the discussions that uh, we have to have to talk about every day or, or even Hussein, Mark and Alan are even deeper in the real estate game. And they, they talk even more about the nuances that they have to deal with on a, on a moment to moment basis um, to the point where even on some of those podcasts, some one of them will step out the door because he has to take a call because there's a, a major tradesman on, on the site that he has to uh, talk to. So sometimes they come right back in and they switch gears because the topic has to change because you know what's on their mind about the current deal or current project uh, has has been evolving in real time. So it's a good way to really see some real time activity of, of how these deals are managed um, incrementally as, as they go towards their maturity. Uh, the other good thing too is we just recently set up a uh, video uh, podcast set up in our office in in uh, Midtown Manhattan, and uh, as of tomorrow or even the day after that, uh, all of that will be available to be seen either on Spotify or on YouTube. You can also access it from our website. So that's another way to check it out. And as we uh, have guests on, you'll start to be able to see the guests. We could just put a name to the face. Uh, as well as uh, we'll do cut-ins to see if there's any footage or if there's anything that is relative to what they're discussing, it'll it'll be a more higher visual aspect to uh, take in the content. All right, so for now, uh, we'd like to open up for a Q&A. If anyone has any questions, uh, we can we can start to answer some right now. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see the, uh, the Q&A panel. Um, so feel free to drop some questions. We'll give it a couple minutes. So one question so far is relating to the urgency of like, you know, why, why would someone need to invest right now as opposed to a couple months from now? That's a, that's a good question. Meaning the fund's not gonna close till the end of the year. Why why not just invest uh, later on instead of doing it right now? I would say that that was one of the reasons that we thought it was very important to make a preferred return tied to these securities. So that means you might have money sitting in your bank account and you'll say, why don't we wait until an asset gets purchased? But if you purchase the shares, the moment that you take ownership of your shares, your preferred return starts to accrue. 
So for example, if you own your shares right now and the first distribution, let's say, is not for nine months from now, at that time, not only are you going to make your preferred return, you are owed a catch-up from all of the time until that happened from that distribution all the way from when you initially purchased those shares. So let your money make 6% until the distribution comes in. It's going to do a lot better in any bank account. I promise you that. All right. Uh, we have another question about the difference between investing in, in a deal with us and a, a traditional uh, LP structure. Hussein, you want to take that one? Sure. So uh, in traditional LP structure, um, you have, first of all, not the same level of visibility that we're offering on the platform. Uh, our intention is to bring people into the process and uh, to <clears throat> expose some more depth of the inner workings. These are very complex transactions. And real estate, while being a relatively simple proposition, uh, comes with it a, a very complicated uh, approach to having to have to execute it uh, just by virtue of the participants and rules, regulations, and everything else, not even getting into the compliance overview that uh, Steve gave earlier. But with respect to a normal LP structure, fundamentally, the biggest difference that we aim to change is that you are at the behest of a general partner and a manager, which to the degree that we are offering a GPLP structure, we are still undertaking the standard GP responsibilities and roles, but the only way that you're going to be redeeming capital in a standard GPLP structure is going to be in a recapitalization event or in a liquidation event or in distribution of proceeds after a successful completion. We, uh, through the use of Reg A+, are offering securities that are tradable. So at the end of the day, if you are uh, invested in our fund, and you decide or determine, or you have things that are going on in your life that require you to uh, gain liquidity. And ordinarily in a GPLP, you would be holding and waiting and you have no control sort of over your financial destiny with respect to that. You have the ability to sell these securities on and redeem your capital outside of the sequence of the operation of whatever investment it happens to be deployed in. So if our fund has <clears throat> a seven year hold period uh, and horizon on it before we are liquidating or selling off assets and, and redeeming capital. Uh, this structure allows the opportunity for more flexibility. Real estate inherently has uh, sort of a chronological lock on it uh, with the way these structures are done. It's a slower moving wheel, takes longer time. Uh, we want to offer the same level of exposure, but with the added benefit of being able to uh, enter and exit uh, through our platform more freely and offer our members and investors more latitude and, and fluidity in doing that. So I would say fundamentally for uh, our LP structure, that is a major difference. Uh, certainly you could <clears throat> compare that to your other standard uh, publicly traded securities, large scale office REITs, large scale REITs in general, although some of the biggest ones happen to have a main concentration in office. Uh, but other than buying and selling those stocks, um, you're not going to have any visibility really into what they're doing. You're going to get CEO letter, you're going to get a uh, quarterly report or annual report, but you're not going to really sort of see how the sausage is made. And that is something that we aim to bring out to, out, out to our members uh, in a way that no other platform is currently doing. So that would be my, my answer to that question. Uh, the next question goes back to uh, digging a little deeper into how the PREF works. Um, there's a question about how it gets calculated. Uh, from when funds are deposited, and then does that affect, or how does that affect uh, the later investors um, with their catch up, as well as does it uh, affect the fund rebel promote? So I'll take that one. That's a good question. So basically, someone would think, oh, if you have a catch up, would, does that mean that income is coming away from other people and it's coming to one person before the other because one came in before the other? So no. Every share that you own is representative of a percentage of ownership in the fund. So the income that is distributed to you is based on that percentage. So for example, I'm just going to use 1% because it's an easy number. If you owned 1% of the shares in the fund, that means 1% of the dividend that's being paid out is representative to you. 
and your catch up will be paid for that. If your catch up is still owed money after that, your catch up will roll over into the next distribution. So basically, everyone has their own catch up and it's representative of their own ownership structure. Nobody else's uh, income will be affected in any way because one person came in before or after the other. And also, the the per, the per return, I believe you asked at the beginning of it, how is it calculated? So, for example, 6% would be 1.5% every quarter. So let's say, for example, you were in and you were in for quarter one, you would be representative of 1.5% before your before the, I guess, the promote would kick in. And so it's 6% annually, but it's, it's calculated quarterly by 1.5% quarterly, and it would be 2% for class A. Okay. Uh, next question is, what is the target amount of money we're looking to raise uh, by the end of the year? $75 million. Okay. And then um, a good question that uh, I, I think is, is a question that a lot of people would ask at some point is, uh, are investors given the tax benefits of the assets depreciation and expenses? I know, Steve, you've been looking into that a little bit. Yeah, so right now, the way it's structured, that's not necessarily um, um, how it's done, because at the end of the day, you do, what you do own is the security, and that represents the direct ownership in the asset. But that is something that we are actively in talks with for with uh, tax professionals, tax attorneys, to see if there is an additional way. Um, you know, that's one of the trade-offs, I guess, at the end of the day of having it um, as a fund. Uh, as opposed to, you know, if you're just doing a real estate deal with uh, one of your buddies or something like that. Also, just to interject, uh, again, if you're doing a real estate deal with one of your buddies and you normally probably have just either an operating agreement or maybe some type of PPM that you guys structured, the entire idea of the structure of a REIT is also over there to help shelter you from additional taxes. Meaning if you go and you live in New York, for example, and you invest in a property in California or in Texas or Nevada or whatever it is, you then are responsible for the taxes for that income from those states as well as New York. The idea of the REIT being structured is a tax shelter so that you do not have to worry about taxation from all the different places that the REIT actually invests. You're only taxed where you live. So that is just an additional benefit just because we're talking about uh, taxes. Just uh, for a compliance perspective, you have to speak, obviously, to your uh, tax professional <laughs> with that. But these are things that we've considered in, you know, um, how we structured it and things that we are always on our minds. And we're always trying to figure out how to get ultimately the best return and um, put everything in front of our investors in the best way possible. Uh, the next question is about, it, well, I guess what came through is that we're very specific about how we select properties. Um, the question is pointing to, you know, what if we don't find enough properties for a return to the investors um, that that we're looking for? Like, so what happens if, you know, if it's just one property or two property? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in, in two parts. First of all, with today's climate, we are going through so many properties on a daily basis. I, I get easily 150 deals a week that we look at. I'd say half of them are off market. Um, right now, deal flow is not the problem. There's a lot of things that are happening in today's economy, especially today's real estate economy. And if you have the ability to be able to you know, network properly, there are deals available, but it's, it's a very good question for another reason. And I'm gonna tell you why. A lot of people like to invest in these large scale real estate funds or these large publicly traded REITs. And a good question to ask is what happens if a real estate fund has a billion dollars of institutional money and this and that, that you'll have to go out there and disperse. You think that they're finding a billion dollars worth of great deals out there? No, maybe they'll find a couple hundred million dollars worth of great deals, but then they end up having to buy these deals that are extremely expensive. that are not going to give off the appropriate returns. And especially with today's market that everything that's going on, a lot of these, you know, office space, for example, how it was looked at over the past couple of years that class A office space should be completely full. It might not be nowadays. And these, you know, trophy assets that they thought would never be vacant are already, you know, showing a lot of problems in the market. So I think it's actually much safer to come into a fund that is going to be up to $75 million in equity to be distributed annually than go into a fund that has to run around and write checks for a billion. 
So because $75 million, comparatively speaking to other funds that are out there purchasing real estate, is by no means an extremely large amount of money, we're able to actually cherry pick the deals that we love. We don't have to just go out there and buy deals that are on the market. Great. Uh, another question is, uh, how can we invest uh, into an IRA in a self? Is it a self-directed IRA, insurance company, or through a financial advisor? Alan or Steve, you have anything on that? So it'd be a self-directed IRA in order to invest uh, with your IRA. Okay, great. Um, that's all the questions we have now. So we can wrap it up. Um, thank you to all the attendees for sticking with us and listening to what we have to say. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, anything to follow up, just reach out to us either through social media. You can go to funrebel.com and you can reach out to us through that. Um, you can also just simply uh, email media at funrebel.com uh, and we'd be happy to address any questions that pop into your heads after the fact. Uh, we'll also be sending around a link to this webinar to all the attendees for uh, future reference. So thank you very much. And we'll go ahead and end it there. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.